This is the fifth international conference that we've organized. And so Gita was actually formed at um, a really early conference in Mexico. And all the other events that we've done have all been sort of focused on discussions that were really important for providers in particular, uh, sharing information about practice and really crucial things that were being learned. Um, and so now that that network has developed and that information has been encoded and, and that it's been really interesting, this conference we've been able to expand the discussion to include experts from other fields that are really related. So we've got people here from um, that practice with Iboga traditionally in Gabon. We've got people here that are experts in addiction and addiction treatment and harm reduction and drug user rights and, and generally in drug policy. So it's um, the importance of this conference is that it's an opportunity for the discussion to be able to grow a lot and for us to be able to do a lot of education about Ibogaine and what's been happening all these years. This conference has brought in all kinds of folks from many, many disciplines. And I think it's, it represents a maturity, that Ibogaine is reaching a maturity, that, um, that Ibogaine came up in the harm reduction movement with Nico Adrian and the, and the, and the junkie boon. Um, it came up uh, as, as, uh, during the war on drugs. Um, and it, it has matured into its adulthood, if you will. And that's what it represents. You know, academics, activists, um, religious uh, people from all over the world coming for this plan. This conference is uh, very important for all of us uh, as, as community. Well, you, you see it, you feel it, bringing so many people, so many hearts together, so many minds together with different, different aspects of this movement. Um, I think some important things that have come up in this conference is around the sustainability of Ibogaine and finding other solutions and uh, respectful communication and collaboration between West and Western science and Western treatment modalities and African traditions and the, the, the wisdom and the needs of the traditional practitioners in Gabon. You know, my focus is really on Ibogaine. It's kind of its own animal, uh, especially in working with uh, substance use disorder treatment. And, you know, I'm also one of the people who kind of says Ibogaine is not like mushrooms and LSD and peyote. It's really a onogenic, which is like a dream producing drug because what's, what's really happening to people when they take Ibogaine is they're having waking dreams. You know, with classical psychedelics, you, your visual perception is, um, is distorted when you open your eyes. And in the case of Ibogaine, you're still dizzy, but the visions go away. That's what you tell people. If the visions get too intense to handle, open your eyes and the visions go away. If you want to be considered a true psychedelic, I sometimes say, it's got to have a 5-HT-2A agonist effect. I mean, and that's sort of by definition. If it doesn't have that effect, it's not a true psychedelic. Ibogaine is not a psychedelic in that respect, in that very narrow pharmacological way. But clearly the experiences that it has, that people have, are similar to other psychedelics. And its pharmacology is much more complex than, you know, Iboga is serious medicine. It's not recreational. And uh, I think one of the best things people could do is get affiliated with organizations like Gita. You know, if you don't, if you just know about it, join if possible. I mean, I certainly intend to. Ibogaine works through something called glia-derived neurotrophic factor, or GDNF. And uh, when this first finding first came out in 2005, I instantly realized this is the mechanism we have been looking for to explain a persistent effect that you cannot get with an agonist, like a methadone, 
or an antagonist like naloxone or Narcan, because those wear off in a few days and you're back to square one. But if you could find something that will cause the nerve cells to re-sprout, that new growth will persist. Vibogaine is one of the only medications that orally stimulates the production of um, glial cell-derived neurotrophic factor, which is GDNF for short. And what that is is a, is a hormone that helps to stimulate the growth of new neurons in the brain. And so this is really helpful in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders, which are caused by a degeneration of dopamine neurons in certain areas of the brain. So Ibogaine is able to go in and be able to do some of that repair. I would not be present at this conference and I would not be interested in Ibogaine if it were not effective in opioid detoxification. Because that's a very robust biological effect. It's not explained by placebo and it's not explained by a main mechanism that we know. Um, so that has always been uh, my major interest is, you know, explaining that. Ibogaine is the only substance on the planet that will alleviate opiate withdrawal symptoms. If you take any other of these psychedelic drugs and you are addicted to heroin or oxycodone, you will be deathly sick the next day. After Ibogaine, there is a blunting, almost a 90% blunting of opiate withdrawal symptoms when done properly in a medical model. This makes this the only substance we know of on the planet right now that will do that. And that is the focus of my attention and the focus of my research. So yes, I would love to see entheogenic drugs find their way into proper use into a psychotherapeutic model. I think we can get much more sustainable results of proper behavior with their proper use. But I began as an addiction interrupter makes it extremely unique from all those other drugs. Psychedelics and iboga, I believe, show us that which what the ego does not want to see. The constructs of life have uh, developed around us so that we think we know what we know. And psychedelics deconstruct that knowledge to make us question, do we know what we know? And Ibogaine does that very much. Oh, is that true? And inquiry in general, cognitive behavioral therapy, is this sentence so true? Is the opposite true? It's not just psychedelics that allow us to look at things in another way. Looking at anything from a different perspective, psychedelics are just very powerful and immediate way to do so and to inquire about our solid constructs, our solid beliefs that keep us limited. And for many of us, the majority, what, what is it, 25% of, of women in the United States are on antidepressants? Can you imagine the people who aren't even reporting that they're not? Then that's one country. And so many, many people are unhappy. And how can we find our happiness? And we're realizing now that if you can take a psychedelic and deal with six to 12 to 18 hours of intensity, you could actually have a many, many days and months of um, inner peace. So psychedelics are like a, um, a sword that cuts through that which we think protects us. These are medicines of the spirit. And if you have diseases of the spirit, disorders of the spirit, depression, anxiety, PTSD, the whole psychiatric spectrum of disorders, they are in the, applied the right way. They're much more effective than any of the accepted approved psychopharmaceutical medications, which largely just uh, put a band-aid over the sy symptoms. They numb you to the sim symptoms and they don't really let you get to the root of your problems, find out why are you depressed, why are you traumatized, how can you integrate that and really heal from it, really recover. Psychedelics open the possibility of being able to do that. So that, in med that if they could be accepted into medicine, that would completely revolutionize medicine and psychiatry. That's why it's going to be very difficult because medicine's a very 
you know, rigid institution and it doesn't like to change and there's a lot of fear that, you know, we're, we're a threat to the medical establishment, we who advocate psychedelics, because they say, well, we, we don't want to overturn the paradigm, we've got too much invested. Uh, one of the main problems is that the uh, pharmaceutical industry cannot patent ibogaine because it comes from nature. And pharmaceutical companies like to own the products that they're spending money to develop and to sell because it is very expensive with all the advertising and the research, et cetera, et cetera. So if they cannot own the molecule, they can't make the same kind of money. The international climate around Ibogaine is very interesting because it's in a real gray area. In the United States, it's one of only a few countries where it's completely prohibited. Um, and then New Zealand and Sao Paulo have recently um, created medical regulation system for it. Um, in other countries where it's not regulated, um, I think it's important that um, research is done to evaluate what systems work better than others. Um, and I th but I think ultimately there needs to be some form of legal regulation in the U.S. so that, I mean, many people in the U.S. don't have the resources to travel down to Mexico to go to a clinic here. Um, it's interesting because drug policy reform right now is changing so quickly. There seems to be a consensus, especially in the U.S., but in some other countries as well, that harm reduction, um, and uh, decriminalization of drugs is the, the politically smart thing to do. Um, but Ibogaine hasn't come up much in those discussions. And I think it's really important to, um, for advocates for Ibogaine to connect with the political dialogue that's going on um, around heroin addiction, around overdose. Overdose deaths have quadrupled in the United States over the past 20 years. Um, and that's become a big political issue. Um, so I hope that Ibogaine, uh, it, you know, becomes thought of as one of the solutions to the overdose crisis and to the addiction crisis in the U.S. and in other countries. You know, we're, we're moving towards a medical model for Ibogaine, and I think that's a very good uh, idea and very important. Uh, I understand um, detoxification of drugs is a medical intervention. It's, it, there's a risk, no, and even without Ibogaine, it's a very complex thing. Uh, so I, I think that's where we have to go to the possibility of having Ibogaine become a prescription medication like in New Zealand and being able to, for people to have access to it uh, in a non-private way, in a public um, way. But that doesn't mean that aside of that, uh, Ibogaine also should be available to those who want it in, in other contexts. So uh, first of all, we need you know, decriminalization, of course, and in the countries where Ibogaine is illegal. Um, but also, you know, for other types of uses, uh, you know, it's important to establish certain ethical and, and safety boundaries uh, and kind of come to a place where services can be offered, you know, within the framework more maybe of personal development or, you know, these workshops where people go and they have a burnout or they're stuck in life and do certain techniques where Ibogaine can be in integrated as one tool in these type of programs as well. I think it's something you have to be very careful with in terms of people ordering it online, uh, people mixing root bark with, uh, with pure Ibogaine, because as, you know, as hopefully your audience knows, Ibogaine is a risky drug um, physiologically. That's another difference between Ibogaine and classical psychedelics is that you know, uh, David Nutt and other people have done studies of toxicity of psychedelics and it's at the bottom of the charts. It's even below cannabis in terms of physical toxicity. That's not true for Ibogaine. Ibogaine has serious cardiac effects and really needs to be worked with with uh, responsible practitioners who have experience with the medicine and the safety protocols that are needed to keep people safe. The main risks um, are cardiac. Uh, I think as we've discussed extensively in this meeting, uh, we had an ACLS course. The C in ACLS stands for cardiac. Uh, you know, so uh, that is, seems to be the vulnerable point. Um, the 
vulnerability, you know, the, the chances of a, you know, undesirable or catastrophic outcome, I think the risks for that are coexisting medical illnesses. I think that it's possible for lay people to be able to do safe treatments, but I do think that there's a certain amount of knowledge that people need to have to be able to ensure the safety of somebody that's going through the treatment. Um, I also think that just beyond making sure that there's not going to be any adverse reactions, there's a whole lot of um, training and preparation that is really crucial for somebody to be able to have. And I think that's something that really will come with time, like how to develop those kinds of programs. I think that's something that gets developed by a whole community and by culture. Um, that knowledge really will come out of like this sort of mass use and this kind of sharing of information that we're doing here. Me, I want to build a place in, uh, in Gabon uh, where will be a meeting between traditionalists and researchers because, you know, all the research done, are, for me, are fake. They don't, the research done on Iboga, you know why? They don't know what plants they use. If you use Tabernante Mani, it's not the same if you use Tabernante Iboga Bayon or Tabernante Montana. It's different species. The, the proportion of alkaloids are not the same. So, you know, they make tests and sometimes, oh, the dogs died. It happens. It's, was it really Iboga or Voacanga Africana? Or why it is, you know, uh, because there is cuts in. They are doing Iboga on the internet. Oh, it's Iboga. You know, there's a lot of Apocinaceae. Same taste, same look, same leaves, but not the same alkaloids. They mix it so we can help the researchers research to make properly clinic test using the same species. Sustainable, fair, sanitary certificates, traceability. So there is a lot of um, you know, unethical and unsustainable Iboga out there uh, for sure. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, the challenge is to work in a way to prevent that to come with other solutions that uh, you know respond to the demand of iboga and, and make sure that people who want to use iboga have access to it and on the other hand uh, you know protect the traditional cultures make sure they can practice buiti without any problems of um, you know having access to to iboga uh, so that's the challenge that needs to be addressed and it's uh, one of the pillars of this conference ah ben, le bois sacré que c'est ce, pas seulement le bois sacré toutes les plantes euh, sacrées, ils sont, ils sont, ils sont malades, ils sont, ils sont maltraités, comme je disais, par les, le, le, la, la, la modernisation. Hein? C'est pour ça que je parle du respect. Si on respecte les plantes sacrées, eh bien, les plantes sacrées, ils seront d'accord pour qu'on les utilise. Ils sont là pour nous. Nous, on est là pour eux. Ils sont malades. C'est pour cela que le monde aussi est malade. Ibogaine saves lives. Ibogaine is unlike anything I think we have out there right now with regard to addiction and healing addiction. Uh, people need to have access to this. Um, we need to strive towards making this available. Also, Ibogaine is dwindling. There's this global uh, explosion of Ibogaine use and need for Ibogaine. Um, the, the Ibogaine supplies in Gabon, where the people who are the caretakers of it, uh, who brought us this beautiful medicine, is dwindling. We need to protect Ibogaine. We need to find solutions. We need to find a way to protect Ibogaine. We need to find a way to protect the forests that Ibogaine comes from. We need to find a way to protect uh, the traditions that brought us Ibogaine. <laughs> Psychedelics can be a catalyst for a far, far bigger change. This could be either a reform movement, meaning that it'll just be sort of sucked up into the, the wider culture, which by anyone's, uh, anyone who's awake, we're, we're in some trouble, or it could be an evolutionary, revolutionary movement. And so 
when I first did a boga and I came out and I was clean, I thought, we have a bomb and I want to drop this bomb in society. Then, when I got started working and I saw that it, it was just a fucking detox in many people's eyes, and I still see a boga as a bomb. A bomb, a, a love bomb, a love bomb that, needs, that, that, that is coming at the right time. But we need to act with it um, and think far outside of, of these boxes. Thank you.